Welcome to Exagility. I'm your host, John Coleman. Professor Rao, it's a pleasure to have you on the Exegetity podcast. How are you doing today? Thanks for having me. I'm delighted to speak to you today, Professor Rao. You're an author of 50 books, and I'm reviewing the latest book. I believe it's the latest book called See the Light in You. And the slogan is Acquire Spiritual Powers to Achieve Mindfulness, Wellness, Happiness and Success. And it features a foreword by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, which I was really impressed about. How did you manage to convince the Dalai Lama to do a foreword on your book? It's really cool. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. The, the topic is of my area of interest. I have written the manuscript, then I sent it to His Holiness Dalai Lama. He read it and he appreciated it. And then he agreed to write a foreword. And this is how the journey has started with His Holiness Dalai Lama. But I'd imagine maybe one million people are writing to the Dalai Lama, but he answered you. So good for you, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. So you wrote 50 books before. This might be number 50. I'm not sure, but roughly 50 books altogether. Yeah. And I'd like to understand how you got onto that part of writing books and the topics of those books. Can you give us just a little bit of history, Professor Rao, on how you got to this place where you're now finally writing this book, but you did previous ones as well, 50 books. Okay, I, I was born in a toxic family and grew up into a toxic environment. And at the age of 18, I joined the Indian Air Force. And I served for 12 years in the Indian Air Force as a corporal in the lowest rank. Then I acquired a couple of qualifications, qualifications including DME, BSc, MEA, MBA, PGDC, LL, PGD, BA, and I earned my PGD subsequent in the year uh, 2011. So then I started developing interest to write books. So for the last 12 years, I have written 50 books. And uh, I have written books on various categories, like students, uh, then on mindfulness, then on executive coaching, then again, uh, on various aspects of training, learning. So I entered into so many areas. And I also wrote a book on strategy, which is pending. But unfortunately, I was on the back due to brain stroke in the year 2021. So I'm gradually recovering. So for the last 12 years, I have written 50 books in various categories. And one more book, which is on the pipeline, is on strategy. It is something about war, strategy, all those things I have to, but it is because of the health issues. So hopefully, I'll get back to the feet and, and I'll be able to write the books. My right hand was paralyzed, so I'm not able to type with my right hand. So I'm typing slowly with my left hand. So still, I'll have to work hard for one year because I'm using blood thinner. So sometimes I'm not sleeping regularly. So many health issues, but I'm not giving up. This is the journey of my life. Okay. So you mentioned that you grew up in a toxic environment. Was that what inspired you to find the opposite of toxicity, like authenticity and spiritualism? Is that what drew you to that area? I was not born in a right environment. And I grew up in a toxic environment. So many challenges were there. That's one thing. Second thing, at the age of 18, I joined the Indian Air Force. I didn't have regular education like others. People think I acquired qualifications, Stanford or Harvard, something of that kind. I never studied in colleges. I acquired qualifications through my self-learning. So that's how I have grown. And I have acquired so many qualifications, despite being a dys dyslexic one. Second thing, despite uh, having ADHD, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, despite being born in a toxic environment, despite having this brain stroke, which has uh, almost uh, ruined my prospects, but because of my willpower, because of the positive attitude towards uh, life. Indeed, it's inspiring. I saw some of your videos of you doing your daily exercise routine to get your limbs back working and get everything back working, basically. So your recovery has been really impressive. Getting back to the book, Professor Rose. So you talk about spiritualism in this book. Yeah. What for you is spiritualism? 
Actually, this means this is required in the current world, not totally because people are emphasizing on materialism. So they should focus on some portion of life for spirituality. It's required because after the coronavirus, things have changed. So people started emphasizing on mindfulness and various aspects. They are focusing on wellness, mindfulness. So this is the need of the hour. And apart from that, uh, we should emphasize on mindful living. We should replace our time uh, presently uh, without any regrets, without thinking about the unpleasant past, without uh, worrying about the future. We should, we must learn to live in the present and we should be mindful. So when we do it that way, so we'll be able to lead a spiritual life, and a happy life. So that doesn't mean that we should stay away from materialism is required because you can't survive without money is required. These are all the basic things. When you look at Maslow, a hierarchy of our needs, so there are various hierarchies. Okay, So these are all the stages of life one has to go in that way. So you mentioned in the book, you compared spiritualism to materialism and it was almost like you saw them as the opposite of each other. And so... Do you think then, could you have a situation where someone isn't spiritual, but they're not materialistic? Do you see being non-spiritual and being materialistic as being the same thing? There's a difference between materialism and spiritualism. And sometimes they both don't gel well. But what is required is we need to blend between spiritualism and materialism. Because materialism is required. Because man can't live without material. So money is required for basic things. At the same time, we should not forgo this mindfulness. So we need to strike the balance between materialism and spiritualism. That's what is required. I also read about spirit as well and the soul. When you're talking about spiritualism, about the soul kind of living on forever. I just like to share my own personal view of life. I'm a Roman Catholic, but I'm not really practicing that. And my views have changed over the year. I still believe in God and all that, but I don't really believe in the afterlife. And so my view is that we turn to dust and I've no doubt that we have a soul and we got energy when we're alive, but I believe we just turn to dust and maybe the energy goes into the eater, but I don't believe there's any follow through, if that makes sense. A lot of my family, though, take a lot of comfort from religion in that they believe that our parents are looking down on us and so on and so forth. And I'd be happier with maybe a cherry tree growing on top of some ashes and believing that there's some form of return of life, that at least the new cherry tree is living on ashes. Uh, but what's your view of the world? And since there was a lot of influence from Buddhism in your book, so would you be a believer that we do come back in some shape or form? It's a very debatable issue and it's a very thought-provoking question. It's very difficult to respond also, but I'll try to respond from my perspective. Yeah. This Buddhism has come from Hinduism, okay? And the second thing is, I'm also a Hindu, so we believe in that after the death, we take birth. I'm not able yeah. to pronounce because of the brain hemorrhage. So thank you for empathizing with me. So Hindus, they believe that in after death, again, we are reborn. Even Buddhism is a branch of Hinduism. So people believe that after death, then we take a rebirth. This is what the point of view by Hindus across the world. And Buddhism is also a slight variation from Hinduism because Buddhism has come from Hinduism. That's how it is. Okay, thank you. And you talked as well about empathy. And I read a book, it was called Against Empathy, which is a really strange title for a book, wasn't it? Against Empathy. How could we be against empathy? Because everybody's talking about us being empathetic and so on. And I noticed as well that you're promoting empathy as well in the book. And the way that book, Against Empathy, the way it put it, I actually ended up being convinced in the end. It was a really strange title, I thought. But what they meant was that sometimes we're watching TV and we see people that we can't relate to, so we're not really showing any compassion for them. But if there was someone in a nearby neighborhood and you saw them on TV and they were in trouble, you can relate to them because they're people like <laughs> us. And then we feel it. And I remember there was a fire in Grenfell Tower in London, for example, and there were people in the area. The, the warehouses were completely full. They couldn't take any more because so many people could relate to it. There were so many people in the area, but they'd see people, for example, in other continents starving and they weren't reacting to it in the same way. So someone put it to me that empathy can be corrupt because what you do is you're looking after people you can relate to and who you like rather than 
people in general, if that makes sense. But I think that's what you meant, though. I think you did mean, when people talk about empathy, I think they do mean compassion. Where were you coming from when you were talking about empathy, Professor Rao? Empathy is a very positive term. It's different from sympathy. Sympathy is different. People often get confused between sympathy and empathy. Sympathy means feeling for somebody else, feeling sorry for somebody else. Empathy means ability to step into the shoes of other person and look at the things from their perspective. Okay, so when you look at leaders like Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, so they are empathetic leaders. They empathized. Okay, they all have so many challenges. Mother Teresa was a symbol of compassion. So what is required is that when we want to build a better world, Okay, when we want to inspire the people, so we need to step into the shoes of others and look at things from others' perspective. So it helps in the long run to build a better world and empathetic world. So I strongly believe that we must empathize with others. This is very much required, but some of the people, they are not empathetic. That's a challenge globally. Indeed. And it leads us on to the topic of authenticity and authentic leaders. And you said something really pithy, which was an authentic leader means ego debt, as in the debt of your ego. And I follow Eckhart Tolle, for example, I'm not sure to pronounce his surname, but he talks about the power of now and the mind, body and all that kind of stuff. And he talks about the ego taking over sometimes. And so here, when you're talking about ego debt, can you tell us a little bit more, Professor, or what you actually meant by that? I read that book, The Power of Now. It's a very good book because this is also something related to my area of interest, that is spiritualism. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we should emphasize the authenticity. And we should emphasize what it is, genuineness. And uh, we have to be very honest with the, what we do, it, what we commit. And so we should be authentic. And it helps in the long run. When we want to achieve such success, we must achieve success with the integrity. Okay, we must emphasize authenticity. We have to emphasize. So what I feel is that we must emphasize the genuineness, so that we can connect with people and we will be able to build a better world and we will be able to inspire others. Okay, thank you. And you also talked about people wearing multiple masks. I talked with Tim Miggum a few weeks ago, and he talked about mood set that we need to bring positive energy, particularly if we're trying to be change agents and we're trying to bring about change. And Marshall Goldsmith does the same as well. He says, if you're an actor in a Broadway play and you've got a sore toe, you don't say, oh, I've got a sore toe and so I can't act tonight. You're a professional, so you just carry on. And I think Marshall Goldsmith was inspired by Alan Mulally, ex-top guy at Ford and Boeing. And when Ford was going through a lot of trouble after the financial crisis, Alan apparently was always smiling and always positive and all that. And in a sense, he was probably wearing a mask, which can be exhausting. But you seem to be against the idea of masks. Or, or did I misunderstand that, Professor Rao, in your book? Okay, let me add, Marshall Goldsmith is a very good friend of mine. Still, I'm in touch with him once in a fortnight. One thing. Mm. I met him in India and he keeps chatting with me because I was on the bed. So he's in touch with me. Okay, that's one thing. And he has written a foreword for my book. Marshall Goldsmith is a great coach and he's very much connected with Alan Mullally. Yeah. Alan Mullally conducted some reviews, uh, weekly reports, everything. Then he somehow he turned around. So wearing multiple masks, that's what you are talking about. So we shouldn't have multiple masks. We should have only one mask. That's better because we should emphasize on authenticity. That's what I believe. And people... Like chameleon, I don't know how to say in English. They yeah, can, they can change they, face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, we say chameleon yeah. leaders. So I don't believe in chameleon leaders. I believe in ethnic yeah. leaders. And maybe some people, they change their mask. Okay. I don't want to comment about X, Y, Z. Generally, I'm telling. Okay. But the thing is that uh, we should have only one mask so that we can stand firmly on the ground. Because truth alone trumps. Okay. That's what I strongly believe in it, that we should emphasize authenticity and we should avoid wearing multiple masks. This is not good because people change their mask for their survival, maybe because of various circumstances, but ultimately we should believe in one thing. Truth alone trumps in this world. 
Yeah. You also talked about just on, on that, trying to be authentic, but also not letting, as you call it, our monkey minds taking over. <laughs> so you had a useful list. I have the book here at page 30. And for the audience, for the benefit of the people just listening who don't have a benefit of video, for example, you say you focus clearly on your goals, engage your mind productively on your passionate area, feed positive commands to your subconscious mind. And actually, that's something that you mentioned again later on in the book as well. You keep saying you should feed your subconscious mind. And I gather it's to do with saying positive things so that you keep reinforcing and eventually your subconscious mind gets the message. Is that where you were going with feeding your subconscious mind? Okay. Okay. I, I'm talking about the monkey mind. Monkey mind is a very big challenge. So mind is never stable because the mm. ideas keep changing from time to time. Even when I write a book or something, I write something. After writing it, then again, I think I could have written better. I could have done a different thing. So like the mind wanders. But once we have made a decision, we should be very firm in our monkey mind and we should do it. That's one thing. Second thing is, you are talking about subconscious mind. The power of subconscious mind helped me achieve my goals in my life. Despite being born in a toxic family, despite coming from a toxic environment, despite being a dyslexic, despite with ADHD, despite several challenges, despite I, am, I was on the bed for almost a year, I am gradually coming out because of the power of subconscious mind, the power of positivity. So mm -hmm. the power of subconscious mind, we must unlock. You will be able to achieve your goals and you will be able to make a difference in the lives of others. You lead your life with the purpose and meaning. You will be able to build a better world. So I strongly believe that we should strengthen our subconscious mind in such a way that we can grow well mentally, physically, financially in all the aspects so that we can build a better world. Indeed. And you also talk about, for example, controlling one's anger as well. you got a lovely one-liner here from Plato. And it says, there are uh, two things a person should never be angry at, what they can help and what they cannot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think your mind is, resonates with my mind. I think we are having some connections. Because of that, yeah. you, know, you and I are connected. Because you are somewhere else and I am somewhere else. But still, we are together. Maybe some powers that have brought you and me. And you basically came up with a checklist as well on how to tame your anger as well. On page 45, being calm before you comment, analyzing root causes, separating emotions from issues and yeah, exploring yeah. ideas. And you got a big long list there. Yeah, really good. It seems like really sensible advice for people who sometimes just get angry and maybe it doesn't serve them. And I think what you mentioned in the book as well is that you actually feel worse yourself after getting angry. The people around you feel bad because you got angry, but you actually feel worse. You seem to be inspired as well by a number of key people like Mahatma Gandhi, Mother Teresa, and the Dalai Lama himself, and Nelson Mandela, and a number of other people that you mentioned. But despite all this focus on feeding your subconscious and looking after yourself and taming your anger, you also talked about the fight against fatigue, which I can really relate to. You talked about the causes and effects of fatigue. You had a formula for it, but I'm sure life is more complex than that. But it's an interesting thing to just get us thinking where you say excitement plus fatigue plus confusion equals mistakes. <laughs> I think you read the yeah. book thoroughly. Yeah? People usually, they just read here and there then the interview, but you are very much committed and dedicated. This is the thing yeah, that yeah. connected. You connected with me really. You know, I'm so happy that you purchased a copy and you are ready sharing everything. It's very inspiring for me. It's an honor that you are interviewing. You know? It's privilege, because uh, it, Professor. That shows your commitment. Okay, now the thing is a little about anger management because I was in the military, I was a bit aggressive actually, maybe because of ADHD. Yeah, I can that, relate to that. Uh, someone in my family uh, maybe has because that you know, sometimes I used to lose focus. I was 18 when I joined Indian Air Force. But gradually I have tamed uh, everything, monkey mind, and uh, I, I have stabilized because I'm 59. Uh, so you can imagine the challenges I have encountered mm -hmm. that helped me to calm down, cool down, and to bounce back and I rose like a phoenix uh, after the brain stroke in the year 2021. The lessons I have learned was be resilient. I have also done a little bit of research about resiliency. That also connected with me because that area of interest is also something very close to my heart. That, that easility. I have that mental easility, physical easility, 
So all those things I'm having. So I empathize with you about all those things. Thank you, because in agility and the topic of executive agility, what I look for is authentic leaders. And by the way, there are quite a lot out there. The metaphor I use is since I started talking about this stuff, it's almost like I'm a light, not that I'm particularly good, but there's a light and it's attracting the moths. Do you know what I mean? As in like really good, authentic leaders are approaching me and it's really good to understand how they tick. Actually, there's a lot more out there than we realized. We can be very cynical and thinking that we're full of people who just want to self serve themselves, but there's actually a lot of really good leaders out there as well. And I've been inspired to hear from them. And just on the humorous side, what you wrote on page 50 and 51 about tools and techniques to fight against fatigue, I'm going to stick that in the fridge so that my other half can see it and just give her a bit of inspiration as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, this is a private joke but people who read the book will understand it when they read it and i will leave that mystery for the readers to check that out but also you have a chapter on overcoming depression as well really useful tips in terms of how you can maybe potentially overcome it some people believe that depression is an emotion some people i know actually really do suffer from it and it's more than an emotion so you have these coping strategies that maybe will help to reduce the effects of that and hopefully shorten whatever sense they have of that kind of depression. And you even have a chapter on staying younger and living longer. Oh, yeah, yeah. We could all do it with a little bit of that. You even have a list for that. But there's a bit that really caught me that I'd love to get your permission to read it. You wrote a letter to your son. You can read. I'd love people to hear this, okay? Yeah. Okay, son. Surround with good books to improve your knowledge and with positive friends to grow as a healthy citizen to add value to society. There's no free lunch in this world. Yeah. Remember, everything yeah. comes at a price. Yeah. Success comes from struggles and sacrifices. Yeah. You must work hard to prove yourself in this cultural competitive world. Yeah. You must identify your passions and pursue them relentlessly. Mm. Focus on your passionate area and strive hard for a minimum of 10 years to establish yourself. Don't be overjoyed by short-term success. Don't get yeah. complacent. Yeah. Remember who wins at the end of life, race counts, not who wins in the middle of life's journey. Yeah. Don't flight, but fight to the finish. Be resilient. Yeah. Don't become a servant to technology. Ensure that technology becomes your servant. Travel as often as you can. Traveling teaches tolerance because you come across diversified communities and cultures when you travel. I served in the Indian Air Force. I volunteered oh. to travel mm -hmm. and I traveled entire India in various aircraft, including the MI-7 helicopter. I learned a lot and I shared my experiences with others during my leadership development training programs. Remember the travel is to lead, respect women, empower them, handhold them to enable them to lead from the front, build bridges, not barriers, don't react, act connect with like-minded people, build trust in others. Remember that trust is earned, not given. Serve others, be a giver, yeah. add value to others, respect all cultures and communities, love your mother, but don't hate another person's mother. That's a really important line, that one. Yeah. Love your nation, but don't hate another person's nation. Don't blame the circumstances, never criticize, complain and condemn others. Start from where you are and with what you have. Follow your heart, follow your passion. You have only one life to accomplish your ambitions. Life is very short, hence make it sweet. Explore ideas for issues. Emphasize ideas, not individuals. Cut the clod as per the coat. Be frugal, not cheap. Have the attitude of gratitude. Maintain a journal of to-do lists to manage your time and stay focused on your goals regularly. Remember, if you waste one second, you've wasted one second of a precious life. Learn from everyone without any ego. No man is entirely good and no man is entirely bad because every good man has some flaws and every bad man has some great traits. Hence, look for the good in others by ignoring the bad. Forget your unpleasant events and forgive others. Character counts, not charisma. Strive for excellence, not perfection. Emphasize means, not ends. Achieve success with integrity. Failure is only a comma, not a full stop. I love that one. Oh, that's a brilliant one. Failure is only a comma. Not a full stop. That's a brilliant one. I'm going to rob that one for you, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> Work for satisfaction, not for recognition. Learn continuously. Share your knowledge with others. Make a difference in their lives. Love, Dad. That's really cool. I really enjoy that. And then you go into social media and so on. 
and it's really very easy to read. I was able to read this book in two hours. It's very easy to read it. I read a lot, so I do read fast, to be fair. I had to read this mindfully because the book was different. So it wasn't like something I could just scan. It was like yeah. a book that I felt yeah. I yeah. had to read. Yeah. But something that comes across very strongly right throughout the book is yoga. And actually, you mentioned something else as well that I'm not familiar with. Yeah, Q-I-G-O-N-G. How would you pronounce that? Yoga is a thing which is required. Globally, anyone can follow yoga. This is required. Many people, they are doing in India, and even across the world also. So this is nice that you have read these aspects about yoga. Professor Rao, thank you so much for coming on the Exegity Podcast. Your thought leadership is inspiring and your recovery as well from brain stroke is inspiring as well. And I wish you the very best with your recovery. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It was an honor to have you here. Mm-hmm.